Joining me in the GMBN tech set today is none other than G Atherton. Now, G shouldn't need any introduction, but in case you've been living in a small hole in a wall or something like that, um, G is a bit quick on a downhill bike. Now, he's got a British title to prove that, along with a European title, a world title, and two gold medals from the World Championships. Now, G has ridden for loads of bike companies and loads of different brands over the years, including Muddy Fox, although that was on an intense, uh, Giant, GT, Common South, Trek, and now, of course, Atherton Bikes. And we're going to be asking him all of your questions. So stay tuned. Okay, so we have loads of questions to ask G that you've all helpfully been sending in. But I'm going to jump the queue here, and I'm going to ask him a question first before we get trucking with stuff. Now, G, what is your favourite bike that you've ridden or had from all of your years of racing? Nothing current, not allowed to say that. Okay, good question. Um, I'd say the first one springs to mind would be the Intense from 2004 that I won my first World Cup on. The old red one. Which was stickered up as a Muddy Fox. Yeah. It was an Intense M1. Yeah, M1 M3. or something M1, like that. yeah, that's it. But a hell of a bike, yeah, definitely my favorite. And um, so, is that your first World Cup win? It was, no. yeah. So first World Cup win, and yeah, that, that one stuck with me. Nice. Right, so we've literally got so many questions to ask you. I'm just going to keep trucking through them and see what we can get through. Okay, so first one is from Harry Selig 8 What was your inspiration for switching and innovating your own bike brand? Oh, good question from Harry. It was a dream for a long time. It was something Dan and I always spoke about, you know, talked about things we could do, the possibilities it would give us, but it really was just a dream because, you know, you don't do that. You ride for, for sponsors and ride other people's bikes. You don't start your own bike company. But then we started to talk about it more and more, met some people we kind of talked about it with, and slowly we started to see a possible path, how it could happen. And suddenly it went from what if to maybe, and then we thought we have to go with this. So we followed it up, we jumped on the ideas, and it was nerve wracking. And you know we made some, some big leaps of, of faith, if you like. Awesome. Okay, I'm, I'm going to keep cracking. I actually want to ask you questions off the back of that, but I want to keep going with Five, what everyone's three. asked. So, uh, Turbo Doing Things. Yeah. What made the Robot Bikes production model so intriguing that you saw it and went, yes, uh, that's what we need to do? And he says, also, laser sintering is sick. As an engineer, I'm fully on board. But as a rider, what made it appeal to you? That's a good question, actually. Yeah, very good question. It's the, it's the, the additive manufacturing, it's the freedom it gives you. You know, as a rider, you want to be able to improve things, change things, you know, adjust things here and there, perfect things. You don't want to hear, yeah, we'll get you that bike in three months' time. Maybe the change is made. Maybe it's not. You know, you want to, you want to be agile and you want to be able to move and 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 go with whatever's kind of working for that moment. And you know, with additive additive manufacturing, we could do that. Um, and you know, we realised this would give us the freedom to create what we wanted wanted to ride and what we wanted to race. And <clears throat> and that was enough for us, you know. I love it. It's, it's bonkers, bonkers technology. It's so cool. Okay, and uh, this is great. They're, they're all directly about your bikes, actually. I was hoping there'd be more questions with different variety, but uh, uh, Richard Upson says, as someone with unique proportions, I tend to find myself between sizes. I tend to make my reach the primary measurement when buying a bike, so I'm very interested in the custom sizes. How does your algorithm that the Atherton bikes use work is it simply a case of entering in your statistics and it calculates optimal measurements? Um, does it take into account riding style and can you tweak it? Well, so there's got quite a few questions in there. Well, the answer is um, it takes into account all of those things. Yeah, you know, there isn't there isn't one thing that you can say, okay, that's what makes this the right bike for you. You know, you need to know someone's size, you know, how tall are they, how long their arms are, you know, what do they weigh, what kind of riding they're doing. Um, and this is all taken into account. And, you know, yes, the, there's a, a fit calculator that they can go on and put this geometry into, and then it will say, this is what's recommended for you. Or sometimes it's a case of, you know, a conversation with an engineer. You know, what type of riding are you doing? Are you doing more trail bike stuff? Do you want it a bit more aggressive for downhill? Or do you want to tail it to something else? And, you know, Sometimes it's a case, like you said, unique proportions where everyone's got a, a different kind of a riding style and what they're doing on it. And, you know, it sometimes is just a case of tailoring that bike to, to what you are going to do on it. Sure thing. Awesome. 
Now, this, this is a cool question because one of the things that comes up when you're talking about different materials is how do you make the bike feel right? So Aiden King, M2B, says, with using carbon and 3D printed, what sort of flex can you be expecting from the frame or pivots? Are they going to be as stiff as a full carbon or a full alloy bike? Well, I think the best thing about, you know, carbon and titanium are great materials to work with. Mm. They're both, they both fit really well with what you want a mountain bike to do and, and how you want a mountain bike to feel. Um, and we knew this from the start, you know, this was, this was one of the, the drawing factors. Um, and we've got some great engineers that specialize in, you know, working with these materials. So it was a case of us as riders saying, okay, this is what we want it to feel. This is what we want it to do. Is that possible? So we would kind of, you know, you almost want to bracket it. You want to go make one that's far too stiff or far too strong and say, okay, that's what we can do. We ride that and say, okay, that's too much. Come back from that. And then you can gradually work your way into that sweet spot in the middle where, you know, you've got that nice flex on the back end that doesn't start pinging off stuff. And it was just a case of refining that. Um, and again, you know, with these materials, you, you can, you know, it's, you can make them absolutely perfect. And with the additive manufacturing and titanium, you know, it's, it's as simple as saying, okay, <clears throat> I want the, the back end to move a bit more. Let's, let's slim this brace down a little, or, you know, I want the back end slightly stiffer. We can beef this yoke up down here on the chainstay. Um, and you know, two weeks later, there it is. So, so would I be right in thinking that, uh, so in a, in a regular full carbon frame, you basically change the layup of the weave to adjust those characteristics, but your carbon tube is exceptionally stiff. And do I assume that you just change the feel of the bike with the layering of like how many layers it might take in a certain area of a certain part of the lugs? Yeah, there's, there's different ways of doing it. You know, um, say on the back end, we can say, okay, we want the, we want a, we want the back end stiffer so we can um, make the sidewalls of the carbon tubing thicker. Yeah. We, can, we can increase that, um, which is one way of doing it. Um, or with the titanium lugs, you can add material, you can take material off. You know, they can, they can, they can simulate all of that uh, on, the, on, the, on the computer beforehand before we even get to the bike, you know. So you can say, okay, this is the force going through it. This is how strong it needs to be and it'll give you this much flex. That's mad, so you can literally do that before getting on the bike. And they can say, okay, this is um, the minimum strength it'll be, see how that feels, and yeah. we'll jump on it and say, no, too much flex. Okay, add a bit of material here, we'll add some there, we don't need to do that bit, we'll keep the weight down, we can leave that alone. That's really cool, so arguably you can get to the end result, in some cases, a lot quicker than the old, the old sort of methods of try 10 different layups or yeah. five different alloy prototypes, then we'll make a carbon one. And, and it's incredible how close they can get, you know. As a, as a rider, you always think, until you're on the bike and you're out in the forest, you know, you're not gonna get a feel for it and you're not gonna be anywhere close. But it was surprising, you know, it surprised me how close they could get replicating that, simulating that on the computer and then saying, okay, this is what we think you're gonna want. Um, I'm gonna push in again and ask another question. So. Riding your own bikes, right, you've got the pressure of this because it's your own brand behind you, it's got to be good. What was it like the first time you raced one? You have sweaty palms? It must have been pretty like all eyes are on you because yeah. you're riding your new bike to prove it. Yeah, that first race was, um, it was, yeah, it was a heavy moment actually. You know, we were, we had trust in the bike and, you know, we tested it and tested it and tested it and we knew it was strong and we knew it was good and we knew it was capable, but when you put that on a live show in front of, you know, X hundred thousand people watching it for the first time ever, suddenly you're thinking, oh, what if this happens? Or what if that happens, you know? And even though you know it's not going to, there's a, still a little voice in the back of your mind saying, oh, I hope that doesn't happen. So it was tense, you know, it was nerve wracking. And there was definite relaxing kind of job well done once we got through that first race yeah. and we were into it and we could crack on then. Next, I was from Dynamics. Uh, Dynamics. Have Atherton bikes used data acquisition and this is something that you'd be interested in using? Yes, we have. Um, I suspect by the name Dynamics might be a data acquisition. Yeah, yeah, company yeah. I'm trying to get a free name mention here. <laughs> well, we do use it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how much that helps because, you know, you can do so many runs in a day um, and get to the bottom and say how you think it felt and how you think it was performing. 
But when you've got that data from a run there on the computer, telling you every little detail and every little change, mm. you know, what the suspension was doing, um, you just get so much more feedback. And, you know, guys like Dave Weagle, who um, designed the suspension, you know, those guys, they, they function on data. You know, the more information you can give them, the better product they give you back. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and that was a case of us just barraging them with as much info as we could and, and him taking it and producing this. MD Morg, this is a great question. Say you were top three in every race for the last three years and not counting Atherton bikes and you had free choice, which manufacturer would you consider taking the Atherton family to with the current lineup? So that's kind of part one. Um, and which brand, if any, could rival your excitement that you get from Atherton bikes in terms of development and vibe, maybe fit your personality? That's like a ridiculous question. Yeah, very <laughs> good. Um, I would say, I would say Commonsar. Commonsar. Yeah, yeah. I love the, you know, it's it's a great vibe there. Those guys, you know, I love the way Max Commonsar operates, the way they've kind of created that brand, the way they've kind of worked with their race team and and their other riders. You know, they've really created something quite cool there. You know, it's got. A, it's got that family feel to it, which I love. And I, I'm really pleased you said Commercial actually, because of the racing heritage behind the brand and with Max, of course. Was yeah, fast, was exactly. Yeah, fast Frenchies back yeah, in the day. Yeah, yeah. We're good friends with Max. You know, he's a great guy, yeah. and I love what he's done with the brand. And you know, we look at them a lot for for inspiration. You know, awesome. Okay, next starts from LC1019. What was the process like to define the kinematic, and what aspects of the kinematic is most important to you? Well, the kinematic of the bike is is massive. You know, it's the it's the heart of the bike. You know, you need that suspension platform to to work well, and we knew that because this bike wasn't just a bike we wanted to sell. It was a bike we wanted to race World Cups on. And if you're racing on a bike that doesn't have great suspension, then it's it's going to struggle. And you know, working with Dave Weigel, it was a case of us sitting down and him saying, "Okay, what do you want this bike to do? How do you want it to perform?" And you know, we've spent years deciding that we've spent years kind of honing what we like what we don't like what works and you know I, we would sit down with Dave and and say look we want the suspension to feel supple off the top but then we want it to ramp up and catch us on those big hits you know it's got to do this it's got to do that um, I run the bike quite progressive so you know when you're at home on the wet slippery stuff it's supple off the top and really tracks those wet roots but on a world cup track when you're taking those big hits and taking those big jumps it still holds you up so there was a, a very specific job that it had to do, and you know we've translated that into the downhill bike and the trail bikes. Yeah, and and, and also just interesting that you're chatting about Dave Weigler. So your bikes use the <coughs> DW6 linkage. So um, a lot of people might not realise this. You see the DW note down there by the dropout. So normally you're used to seeing the DW link. It says DW6, it's a six bar rather than a four bar, and. Essentially, the job is to perform just like the DW link, but allow for the fact that they can offer different sizes and configurations in the frame layout without affecting the feel of suspension. It's like it's insane, actually, what he's managed. I'm not surprised because the guy's the guy's a bit crazy, isn't he? Like, yeah, this is a hip hop. Wears white sandals <laughs> and uh, white yeah. socks and sandals and stuff. Yeah, but he's a great guy to have on board, and you know we wouldn't have been able to do this without him. Yeah. Um, and like you say, you know, the suspension had to do a very specific job. It had to work a very specific way and it had to fit in with that additive manufacturing uh, technique where you want it compact, you want it slim, you know, you want it quite neat in the bike. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think it's, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of firsts with this bike brand. I think it's really cool. Okay, next up is from Potter D 17 How did you know where to start with designing the bike? Did you have any knowledge before starting or was it all outsourced from professionals? I mean, it feels like you spent your entire career yeah. developing Yeah, I mean, I would like to say I do have some knowledge beforehand. You know, yeah. we've spent, you know, 10, 15 years developing race bikes and, and, and that is what gave us the confidence to take on this project. But at the same time, building a bike from scratch is very different to refining a bike. You know, if someone gives you a, a bike that's quite good already and says make it better, it's, it's not an easy job, but, you know, we, we know where to start. But starting a bike from scratch is is very tricky because the first time you jump on it there are a lot of unknowns there are a lot of variables so when you're going into a turn and it's bogging down a bit or it's kicking a bit or it doesn't quite feel comfortable 
there's a lot of variables to try and decide what that is. You know, is it the is it the way the suspension's working? Is it the geometry? Is it the is it the actual materials of the frame? Um, and you have to hone in on each one of these things and say, okay, is that right? What can we change? How can we change it? So there was a lot to do. Um, and it wasn't as simple as, you know, as we expected, to be honest. You know, it's it's like anything when you start it, it's always more work than you expect. So it was it was difficult and, you know, still now, um, a year later, an, an ongoing process and something we're still changing and refining and, and honing. But I guess, I guess in addition to that, you've kind of fast-tracked your way there because of all those years working with brands that say have got like a good bike, you help them make their good bike, you know, World Cup winning bike, you know, by trying different chainstay lengths or bottom bracket heights or suspension configurations. So you kind of knew, you know, you weren't punching smoke, like you knew exactly where to start thinking or actually it's a bit baggy. It could be the chainstays, it could be the bottom bracket, it could be here. So I think you kind of, you had a bit of a leg up. Yeah. In the best possible sense. Like, no, you're exactly yeah. right. And the better you can make that initial starting point, you're making your life so much easier. And, yeah. you know, I think we got to the first World Cup with, you know, maybe the third or fourth prototype, which is... That's ridiculous, actually, it to is, have that little it, prototype. It is quite, racing. yeah, it, it is very surprising. But it was incredible how good we could make the first one using, you know, the software and the engineers and Dave Weagle with that suspension kinematic. Yeah. Um, even working with the guys at Fox to, you know, say, okay, we're going to do this. This is what it's going to do. What do you think? And, you know, the more information you can get together at the start and the more people you can bring on board and the more data you can accumulate, the better that first iteration is going to be. And it gives you such a head start then. 100%. Yeah. Um, ne next one's an in-house question. This one's from Donny. He says, have you ever broken a bike worse than the snow crash? <laughs> oh, Donny, the snow crash. If you haven't seen the G Snow Crash, uh, go on YouTube and type in GF10 <laughs> Snow Crash and you'll find it. Um, I mean, no. how did you even survive that, to be fair? That's ridiculous. I, I couldn't tell you. I remember being in the air, <laughs> still climbing as I passed the landing and just thinking, you're going to have to brace now. Hold on. And I remember coming into the landing just thinking, right, you're going to have to brace as hard as you possibly can. And then it all just goes black, so I have no idea. But yeah, the bike was... It was pretty. Was uh, it still in one piece? Did it break in half? I can't no, remember. it took it well, but everything was just bent. The wheels shattered. The forks. Maybe it's were... like a little single crown fork, and it. Yeah, it was a remember. trail bike. It was like a giant <gasps> trance, I think, or something like this. You know, the bars were like bent down and out. You know, I must have oh, the force I put through that bike. Yeah, the poor thing. You want thing. to sort of like magic it into a downhill bike when you're mid air for that? Oh, I don't think anything would have helped. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have done it. Um, okay, so I think we touched on it earlier, but Toffee Dan says I'd like to hear the full list of brands you've ridden for over the years. And did you enjoy the Muddy Fox days? Okay, Muddy Fox, Giant, GT, Common Sal, Trek, Athlete Bikes. There you go, there's a list. And how were the, uh, how were the Muddy Fox days? I guess pretty good, because you kind of yeah, Muddy went, Fox went from days. being good to like, bang, World Cup. Here we go. Yeah, Muddy Fox days were... That was a different beast, you know? That was literally, here's a bike, go and race it. Like, I don't remember adjusting a single thing on it, you know? I I, I don't remember adjusting my suspension or like making the fork just stiffer. Just rode it as it, as it a was. Tire so pressure, yeah. I remember just, it was just your bike, you know? And that's that's what, I would jump on it and race it and then I would never adjust huh. anything. So Unbelievable. It'd be interesting to see, well, I guess you don't have the bike anymore, but to find out how different your setup was back then to what it is now. I mean, we talked few... about your suspension, you said you like the suspension quite fast and you always have. The other setup stuff. Yeah, I think there's, a, I think there's definite, you know, there's definite setup traits that have stayed with me through my whole career. You know, the way, the way I run the, for example, I've always run the fork slightly stiffer and the, and the back slightly softer, so I ride off the back. I've always run it quite fast probably due to like the, the riding we do at home, but there's been a few times where I wish I could just clip my fingers and magic a bike back from the past, you know, as it was then, and it would be quite interesting to see it. Cool. Um, all right, so next one's from Paolo Mojo, uh, Mojo Sem. What's the best non-Atherton bike you've ever had? I think we're gonna go to the same bike here. Um, and why, perhaps suspension design, warm fuzzy feelings, because you won on it. Um, also, second question, are you riding a mullet setup for 21? Um, last question first, 
Probably will. I'm on the mullet now, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick with it, and a lot of boys are, are going that way. Um, what works about that for you, out of interest? Because you've ridden 29s for quite a while. In fact, the last bike check I did with you was on a 29 trek, I think. Yeah, I've ridden 29s a lot. Um, I think the 29 does work well. It's It works well in certain conditions and not others. Um, I like the 27 because I ride off the back. I can get a bit lower, sometimes on steep, steep rough tracks where the rear wheel works as all, almost, you know, it's like a bit of a turbo. It's like pushing you down the hill and with a 27 and it's, it'll be easier to control and, and slow down and, and manage the speed with it. That's interesting. In interesting points, actually, especially as like, you know, some other taller riders are firmly fixed, like Minnow you know, on the 29, <laughs> but obviously it's not working for you and you're 6'2", 6'3". Yeah, yeah, 6'2". Yeah, that's cool. Um, we missed a question there, though. Oh, yeah. Jump yeah. back. I would say, well, I've said that the, the intense Muddy Fox already, but... I would go back to my common style. They work really well. I love the way the, the kinematics work. You know, they they had they were ahead of their time. I think with where the engineers were, were taking that bike and and you know where it is now just shows how good those guys are. Yeah, um, and also actually, um, it was probably one of my warm fuzzy feelings actually about when you won a race was was the triple header. Yeah. That weekend on, on the, the common style. style on the common style home turf in Andorra. Yeah, yeah there Insane. we go. <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> the most ridiculous thing to happen? Like it's so cool. Yeah, that was good. I must have had a good party after that. Underscore could underscore be anyone. Is there a plan to produce larger quantities of the bikes for the public to purchase at a reasonable price? Um, before you answer that, I, I take offence to the reasonable price because I actually think what you're getting for the money is pretty reasonable with what's actually gone into them. And I think compared to a lot of other bikes, bikes you can buy off the shelf that are same if not more expensive, I think... Um, they are actually pretty reasonable, but I understand what you mean. He means at price point, yeah, uh, slightly more affordable. Yeah, no, I understand. I think you, uh, I think he wants it more reasonable. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is fair. And the plan, the answer is yes. Um, that is the plan. You know, we want to, we want to, we want to move things forward, refine it, increase the production, um, and yeah, that's all in the in the plan over the next year or so. Um, so yeah, watch this space. Cool. Um, Awesome questions there and great answers. Uh, one last one, actually, I just want to poke in here. Am I right in thinking the first 50 were available for so, to go up on, on sale and start being designed and stuff uh, in, was it October? Yeah. Um, how many have gone out so far? Like, Are there bikes in the wild yet? Like, have consumers got any? There are, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's, there are a lot. I couldn't tell you the number off the top of my head, but um, yeah, there's been a lot going out. Um, you know, we're doing it quite low-key to start with. Sure. Like we said earlier, we want it to be quite organic and, and kind of growing quite steady so we can stay on top of things and not have to rush things and, and, and make kind of sacrifices and cuts. So, But it's going really well. And the feedback we've had from people that have bought the bikes has been incredible. You know, there's... There's no better feeling than, you know, the guys opening their emails Monday morning, having a message from someone, the bike turned up, I've been out on the weekend, I love it, great work guys, you yeah. know, that's such a pat on the back for everyone that's involved and, you know, they're, they're the messages that really make, make us feel like what we're doing is worthwhile and, yeah, it's, it's cool to see that feedback from everyone. Oh, I'm, I'm envious in the nicest possible way, I, th <laughs> I think it must be so satisfying and uh, fair play, Jim. I think it's amazing Thank what, you, you, mate. what you and the family is doing. Uh, some great questions there from everyone. If you've got any more for G, he might be visiting us again soon. So get him in those comments underneath. Uh, thanks, as always, for watching our videos. And we'll see you in the next one. And look out for a G Pro Bike coming very soon on GMBO Tech.